Everyone, at 7.01, I will call the August, so yeah, how about September 14th, meeting of the Pembroke School Committee to order. Um, just so everybody's aware, we are, we do tape the meetings, they are on PAC TV, and they're also posted to our website, um, with usually within 24, 48 hours of the meeting, and they are also taped so that Natalie, our recording secretary, can take the minutes. Um, so, no adjustments to the agenda? Um, there was a sign sheet if you want to speak. What I thought we'd rather do a public comment at the beginning, we'll do it after the superintendent's report like we did last time, make it a lot easier for folks in case you have questions. So I won't put, ask for the sheet until the until she's done or the committee's done. So if you want to, you can hold off or wait, but we'll take it whenever um, whenever we get to that section, if that's okay with everyone. Okay? All right. So um, we have a couple minutes to approve. So can, is there a motion to approve the minutes of August 17th and August 31st? So moved. Second. Motion by David, second by Sue. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, abstain, unanimous. Outstanding. Okay, so um, let's go to the, we can, we'll do the contract why don't we do that afterwards and we get the superintendent's report and also we can let the principals go um, and you can do your report so what we'll do the back to school report and then go into um the, the contracts afterwards make sense how did you want to go that's perfect i'm going to start with the principals um do you guys have an order preference or can i do it in my order <laughs> you go. So I'll start with um, North Pembroke. Um, the enrollment at North started the year at 517 students, and approximately 65 of those are in pre-K, just for our frame of mind there. And there were also a few changes in teaching assignments, um, which were also very exciting for the staff. Um, teachers moving from upper grades to lower grades, people just re you know ready for a change in their, in their life. So um, it actually worked out very well. Um, some new teaching staff there. We have Miss Jenna Novio helping out for Miss Cook's medical leave. She's doing a fantastic job and is being fully supported by her grade level colleagues, which is great. I was in there today and got to see her work a little bit. And uh, Miss Val, uh, our esteemed vice principal, who's been wonderful, um, a great addition to the staff. Um, we've been actually collaborating every single day, um, so we're in constant communication. And um, She's also being supported tremendously um, by the district admin team, which she had mentioned quite often for, to me. Um, so I know you guys are down there quite a bit, so I appreciate that as well. Um, and uh, she's actually embarking on community meetings this week. So she's starting to get to know all the community members. She's starting to get to know the teachers a little bit more, to get the, to know the kids a little bit more as well. And I think you're very familiar with the community meeting aspect where we're, we're bringing large groups of kids together. But when, when I say large, I mean a grade level at a time, hmm. socially distant. Um, and what we're doing right now in working with her is she's trying to incorporate North's character traits into the daily discussion. Um, and you, you can hear those echoed over the loudspeaker in the morning. Um, it's kind of like a whole cohesive program that they have running. Um, Val reported that she also hosted a couple of meet and greet sessions upon accepting her new position at North and she's already been having discussions with parent and community members around um, restorative practices and restorative justice ideals that North is embracing. Um, and that's something that Mrs. Swift um, started over the um, last year and also over the summer months. So she's keeping that going, which has been wonderful. And um, the whole idea of those is to kind of foster relationships between staff, students, um, and families. So all three um, stakeholders. So um, North is up and running and doing very, very well. So any questions about North? Let's flip to Hubbamock. <laughs> uh, so Hubbamock, we started our enrollment of the year at 411 students. And uh, 20 of those new students, um, I'm sorry, 20 of those students are newly enrolled, so never been in Hubbamock before. And those are not inclusive of our kindergarten families. So we actually had quite a few families, uh, new, newbies join us, which is great. 
Um, and I'm actually excited that we actually have five students return to us from um, homeschooling last year. So, um, which was, it was great to see. Some, some families just chose to take a year off and they came right back to us this year. So happy to have them back. Uh, we have some new teaching staff to um, let you know about. Miss Colleen Peckerell is a grade one teacher, and Ms. that's probably a familiar name to you. She, um, she was with us last year in a couple of different capacities at grade five for a long-term sub, and then she just very easily went right down to kindergarten and did a fantastic job down there. So we had some... She did, and she's a graduate of Pembroke High School. She didn't graduate, she didn't leave Pablo out that <laughs> So, um, you know, uh, the superintendent and I had some discussions over the summer. We've been looking at the numbers um, in our first grade, and um, we actually had quite a few move-ins to first grade, um, and we were looking at the numbers, and everyone agreed with it myself, and thank you to your support as well. We were able to add another section back of first grade. So you'll remember back when we started doing the budgeting in the spring, um, we were having a harder time than normal to figure out what the grade one enrollment was. So figuring out whether families chose to keep kindergartners home, whether they'd be joining us as grade one students, or whether they'd be joining us as year older kindergartners. Um, so at, through the budget process, we did have an elementary position that was identified that could have been reduced somewhere that we didn't necessarily cut. So it was floating um, within the budget because we knew that there was going to either be a kindergarten need here at North or a first grade need at Habama. Um, so it, it turned out that the need was the first grade at Habama. And the really great thing about um, how this all played out was Ms. Pecker was able to loop with her kindergarten students right into first grade. So for, for that continuity for the kids it made an awful lot of sense. And she also um, took in most of the newer students to us um, in grade one. So it's a nice classroom. We also welcome Ms. Allie Masisso, our new music teacher um, coming from the Plymouth Public Schools, um, who actually took the place of Dr. P, Dr. Pinella, um, who took an admin position um, in her hometown. Um, and we also welcomed Ms. Genevieve Carsargen, um, a special educator um, coming from the Wareham Public Schools. So she's been a great addition to the staff already. Um, so in addition to that, um, we have had a lot of excitement because we also had some grade level changes um, with staff. And actually it was really, it was, it was a nice process. We actually had some good discussions in the, um, in the springtime. And there was, there was a lot of teachers that actually wanted to make the move at this point in time professionally. So it just worked out very, very nicely. Some of the new initiatives we have at Habermock is Ms. Noons, our physical education teacher, has unveiled a new health and wellness challenge for the entire Habermock community. So I'm happy to um, report that we're going to be talking about something called WWHG, Where Will Habermock Go? Um, and what it is is it's 10 minutes of um, activity, um, and we're, we're asking the kids to be more active, we're asking the staff to be active, and for the parents to be active. And uh, 10 minutes of activity equals about a mile, okay? So there's some math involved there. Um, and what, th what that equates to is that um, the kids will be actually monitoring their uh, progress over time, and it's actually an incentivized program where after 200 miles that a class gets, they get to take a virtual um, field trip to something that's 200 miles away, the Basketball Hall of Fame. Um, so it's kind of a cool idea, um, and it's already got a lot of uh, momentum going. Uh, the bulletin board's already up, and we talked about it at staff meeting today. Uh, we're also going to be getting back to our community meetings uh, for the last week of September with a focus on character development as well. And as far as curriculum, um, we are really excited to launch uh, a new social studies curriculum in grade five uh, with the help of Mary Beth. Uh, she's been instrumental in getting that to us. And we're also beginning to analyze some of the revisions to our Envision math program. So revisions to Envision, um, to the math program too, because um, that did change a little bit. Um, um, to, to add some new components for the kids, um, both on the online format, but also in the text. So um, we've already started that discussion today at um, our staff meeting, and actually that will be going right into grade level meetings next week. So overall, it's been a very smooth opening to the school year. Any questions for anybody? Thank you. You're welcome. Next quick question. Um, you talked about enrollment. Sure. Um, what are we expecting district wide for 10 1? Are we expecting an increase or are we looking at a potential? Um, so, as of today, we're at 2,577. That's right around where we um, anticipated being. Our high school enrollment is off by about 10 or so. Okay. Um, there's still a couple of homeschool families that um, we're working through paperwork for. Um, so, those student enrollments will shift a little bit over the next couple of days. Um, but uh, Okay, so we're not going to no. we're not going to see a spike or a, or no. a big drop. Okay, thank you. Hi, hi everybody. 
Well, so, thank you. So, Brian Bell is also off to a really wonderful start. I keep saying, at least seemingly, I haven't heard otherwise yet. Um, we are at the moment around 440. It does seem to consistently still change day to day with um, you know, charter schools or move-ins, but we're pretty holding tight at 440 currently. We also have new staff members. We had to welcome a new school psychologist, and we were able to hire Maria Robbins, who is from uh, Bridgewater Raynham with eight years experience. So we were really excited to have her to just bring her wealth of expertise and knowledge right into the team, because that's a real important aspect over at Brineville and just for myself. We also hired a para, um, and we were also able to substitute at grade two and six we were able to bring back Brooke Rinkus who worked at North last year in various long-term positions and then we were able to bring Joe Powers who was the remote sixth grade teacher last year as a long-term sub in sixth grade this year so that is all going well and the transitions are going really well for the kids because both teachers ended the year at the grade they're starting at we had meet and greets over the summer with parents and with staff. It allowed us to you know, learn and gain valuable knowledge from both groups of people. We were able to really get to know some of the new kids at the new student tour, which was great. The feedback of Bryanville was all positive and just having worked with the staff, I knew we weren't gonna have to do much change. It was sort of just writing the ship. Uh, a few things based on their feedback. They mentioned the dismissal could be a little crazy and hectic, so we brought some ideas over and implemented that, which seemingly have gone over well. And then we are also bringing over the community meetings, which is something we did at North, and I knew Mr. Murphy brought it to Habamock, so just to have that consistency at all three elementary, I thought that was important. So we had our first on Friday, where we take here at North, the character traits are lined up with the leadership, but we were actually able to with Bryanville. So it's just sort of the important words that make Bryanville a community, and that's what the community meetings focus on. The curriculum work that Mr. Murphy mentioned in science and soul studies and math where that's going to go. That's exciting work coming up. Anything else? He mentioned everything else, really. <laughs> that's what I heard. That's what I heard. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm excited. Oh, Donna, why don't you go next? We'll make Mark wait for all right, welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, so PCMS has 412 students, um, 213 seventh graders, 199 eighth graders. The custodians did a phenomenal job, like stripping, waxing, painting. The building looked awesome, awesome at the beginning of the year. There is a lot of new staff at the middle school. I'm just going to like read the names down and their, what they're working on versus their history. Uh, Ms. Daniel McLean is the new seventh grade guidance counselor. Ms. Carly Wilson is a new special education teacher. Mrs. Rayula Sarhal is a world language teacher. She's going to be teaching French 7, French 8, and one section of Spanish 7. Mrs. Cheryl Piawanis um, is a previous North teacher. Uh, we're really happy to have her at the middle school and she has adjusted really well. She's a sweetheart. Um, Mrs. Ellen Jones is our social worker. Um, she's been a great addition. Ms. Julia Eisen is our um, library paraprofessional. Um, she was with us last year for a year as a long-term sub, but we were very excited to formally hire her um, this year. And Mrs. Jamie Joyce is a special education teacher. Frank Paterino is a long-term 7-1 social studies um, teacher uh, in place for Mrs. Leslie McDonough, who's on maternity leave, and we have a full-time 
school psychology intern, Ms. Julie Cotillo. So to get licensed in school psychology, you actually have to work full time for a full year unpaid, which is great. So we really appreciate having Julie <laughs> with us and she's been really helpful. Um, so the beginning of the year, we had our guidance counselors officially start eight days before the teachers. So once they got back, we gave them a, like a, you know, a day to kind of get oriented really quickly and then we started doing our tours. So we did three days of tours and then we did an orientation on the first day of school, 60 minutes in the morning and another 33 minutes in the afternoon just helping kids to acclimate. Last year we did not do a rotating schedule. We felt like the families and the students and the staff <laughs> probably had a lot of change they were absorbing so we felt like keeping the schedule as um, consistent as possible was important. This year, with a more closer to normal year, um, we wanted to bring back rotation. Um, it helps them get used to it. It helps change up when classes are meeting, so they're not always, say, if they're not a great math student, they're not always meeting at math at 7.30 in the morning. It changes up what time they're missing with the, they're getting their classes. Um, although eighth graders last year didn't rotate, they learned it really quickly, I think because they knew the building. And the seventh graders, um, as is usual, just took a couple more days to get to know kind of how to navigate their schedule. Um, but I feel like for the most part, everyone's in really good shape now with understanding how to get around. Um, we have 56 students in our Title I program. That's Literacy Enrichment and Math Foundation. And 51 in Math Foundations. Uh, Title I is a program, uh, consistent Brian Bill also has it, where we can provide some extra support. Students that take Title I at the middle school, take it in place of a world language. Um, and we get, the students get identified from working with the sixth and seventh grade teachers on who could use the extra support. Should I skip the coaching? Okay. Um, so we, uh, we had several teachers attend a co-teaching training on this Tuesday all day and last week. Uh, we have co-teaching in math and EOA is a general content licensed teacher along with a special ed teacher and the goal is to have them develop a relationship where they're working on identifying, building curriculum, working together, grading um, to better support students in the classroom. Um, we are adding in social studies at the middle school um, this year and that is who we train. The new special ed teachers along with the so social studies teachers got trained this year um, and they, are, they should be good to go. The training was good got really good feedback. Thank you to Jess Duncan, DiLorenzo, I'm sorry, okay. um, and Meg Cullum and Mark Talbot um, for support around this initiative. And, sorry, I got a lot. Um, we have a new science initiative called Open sci -Ed. We had our science teachers take the training either in June or August. They'll be doing additional training in January. Um, open sci -Ed is not a curriculum package in the same way, although there's units. It really is about focusing on skills and content and mastery, and more importantly, also on helping teachers have deep knowledge on what they're teaching and having peer support around that. So uh, Jonathan Shapiro has been critical in getting that initiative into the middle school and finding funding for it as well. Um, for the, those of you here last year, you were aware. Uh, cross country started yesterday. There are about 50 students signed up. Um, we offer orchestra and chorus enrichment classes once to twice a week during um, Titan study. Um, Greg Tarbox teaches in all five schools, so we work, really work around his schedule. He teaches, I should say, he teaches in all five schools. Uh, so we work around his schedule. Um, Gwen Chapman uh, works in all five schools, but teaches in two, so we work around her schedule too, which is why you'll see uh, every week I will be posting when uh, those classes are available for students that would like to join. After school clubs, so we're in the process of gathering all the information on the after school clubs. I would anticipate that they would be, um, we'll let the kids make aware that maybe next week or the beginning of the week after and get those up and running. We had them virtually last year, so we're hoping kind of an in-school, in after-school club would be uh, a nice experience for them. Almost done. Uh, 21st century skills, so um, students have a weekly guidance class. Um, students will be goal setting in their class, um, building up to their term one academic check-in. So guidance counselors um, have about 200 students each. Um, I want each student to have an individual check-in every term, because I think learning to 
be successful in middle school is really important. So um, the goal setting is a precursor to the academic check-ins, which will be happening during um, elective classes. Um, so there's that. Tree donation. Last spring, the Conservation Commission and Open Space Committee donated a tree to each of the schools um, with the best of intentions. I'm not sure any of us got to close the loop on that. Um, <laughs> Well, I know I didn't, um, so, um, so um, Tracy Marino had reached out along with Art from the um, Conservation Committee about getting the process in place. I had asked my guidance counselors and school psychologists for recommendations, so we've identified four students based on their kindness, empathy, leadership skills, and I spoke to them today and asked if they would help me and the day custodian identify the location of the tree. So um, we're going to walk through what we think and the, the various areas that it may work. Then we're going to let the students consult with each other. Then we're going to have spray paint, and we're going to let X max the spot. Um, and then after it's planted, we'll bring the students back, to, the four students back, to get a picture and get it posted. Um, they were really excited to be kind of part of something that's going to be um, like a really awesome uh, donation to middle school. So that's great. appreciate um, that work. And um, we are going to be um, newsflash. No one knows about this yet. We're going to do a Go Gold fundraiser. So that's a fundraiser for childhood with cancer. Um, I, we did it last year. Um, so we're going to be selling face masks and taking donations, as well as having a Go Gold Spirit Day. Are you guys doing that? <laughs> 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 so that'll be hopefully coming out next week with the details around that. And our open house is on September. 30th. Um, it is going to be virtual as the other ones are. So um, we are working with Erin Tinker on trying to make that um, as painless as possible for families to kind of go through each link. Um, so I'll be pushing up our information on that too. Any questions? Yep, so there we're going to be doing. Um, the chocolate factory. So we, we went to do that last year, so we'll be doing auditions um, in probably December. Um, what I've talked to, what Gwen has talked to me about um, is wanting to do the drama club this year, six, seven, eight, as a way to really integrate sixth graders into the middle school more easily, um, as well as, you know, obviously expand the, exp you know, and I think she's talking about maybe North being the site of the practices, we'll be doing the performances at the high school because the quality of their sound systems. Um, the kids work really hard at the drama club, and it's hard when, they, you know, when, when there's some breakup in the sound system. So, so how are we going to get middle school, Bryanville, and Mock children to North? So I think that Gwen had said, talked about the late bus, but she, right. as so you, you always remember, know with Gwen. We have the late bus at the secondary level, yep. so the middle school students have come. And we also have had the after school music program here at North for the past couple of years, where yep. Brian Hill and Hobmock students, they stay on a certain side number bus to come. Okay, I just want to make sure there's yep. a way for the, for the kids who want to participate to yes. get here. So, the, so the, the middle school kids would go to North? So the all I think what Donna said is that the rehearsals would be here. So the middle school the middle school students would take the late bus to North. To North. Okay. Yep. And then the other two elementary schools have the opportunity to ride the bus from the their school to North. Yes. Yeah. From okay. here. Yeah. So excited about that. I talked about it a little bit at the tours. We have some of the costumes because we meant to do that last year, and obviously we didn't get to it. So. Yeah. Okay. I have a couple questions. One was just a stupid question, but every time I go to plant something or pick a spot. It, there's piping running through or electricity. So have we ruled out all those spots so the kids don't pick a spot and then find out that they can't pick it there? Um, so I know what, it's crazy. Yeah. Plumber's no, daughter, it's not I crazy. That's why um, Bobby Flynn, the day custodian, is going to be with me. As right. we so they have maps of the buildings and all yeah. the infrastructure as far as Okay. Uh, I just didn't want them to get all excited about a spot yeah. and then be disappointed. Yeah. Because that's the world I live in. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. so, um, and also, how many, how many um, co-teaching situations do you have? I wasn't sure. Did you say the number of... So like it that? varies a little bit based on level. Um, so right now, we, we've done math for multiple years, and we always had one to two sections of math in eighth grade. There is, I think, two sections of, in math in eighth grade, one to two in seventh, and then one to two in English, too. So next year, this year, it's one section of social studies. So what we're integrating into is one section in seventh grade and one section in eighth grade. What's the end goal? What are you hoping to get to? The end get goal would also to incorporate science. Um, so you'd have kind of the more the four major content areas. 
um, with Open Sayed this year being a, you know an initiative that that requires a lot of PD and training and focus, um, we are, we were just going to wait to build it a little bit later. We'll figure right. out whether or not next year is the right year. But so we've talked a lot at the committee level about co-teaching. Jess has done a couple of presentations about it. It is an excellent structure. It is a very expensive structure because you're talking about two full-time teachers in the classroom with one group of kids. Um, so we've been able to take advantage of some of the opportunities in schedules to create pockets of co-teaching without adding additional staff for that purpose. But as we move forward through budget cycles this year and following years, there's potential to have an increased staffing request based off of the want and desire to incorporate additional sections of co-teaching. Right. So I think we've had some really going. great success with it. Yeah. Yeah. Just um, thinking about it, yeah. the end goal was to have mm -hmm. every class of co-teach. I'm thinking, okay, then now. Well, not every just, class, right? No, there's, no, there's, no, there's, no, there's, there's a certain profile of class, class right, but. Is, is an inclusion class, but um, we started, I think, if, at the teen level, we think about the teens in seventh grade, at least um, having one with the training so um, we brought back the same trainer two years ago um, as we expanded at the middle school and then this is our third time bringing back the same trainer um, and then this year we also um, incorporated our curriculum content coordinators into the training um, any administrators that haven't been trained so that they understand kind of the expectations and um, eventually when we talk about kind of evaluating the settings um, but they're familiar with the models um, so the consultant is excellent. Um, she also came back and worked with us in more of an observational kind of next steps for our teams at the secondary level. So she came back about six months later um, and observed and gave feedback. Um, and we plan to do that again um, with her later in the year. So. Thank you. So just a heads Thank up, you. the only feedback in the mailbox is that if people could speak directly into the microphone Sorry. because they can't hear us at home. <laughs> That's all. Okay. So I'm just checking the mailbox. You're good. <laughs> Just, yeah, so just real quick. Yes. Um, SC, I was going to do this later, but SCInfo at PembrokeK12.org, if people at home want to write, send an email um, to the. Yep, we're checking the, it through yeah, the meeting. We're, we're checking, we've done it we've done in the past and we've gotten some feedback. So I just want to remind folks who aren't familiar or forgot the email address is SCInfo at PembrokeK12.org, and we'll get to those questions as we can. So, sorry about that. You good? I'm good. Any other questions Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Talbot. Good evening. Um, at the high school, we were eager to welcome 784 students to the building this year. Um, and before I really get too much of the nuts and bolts, I just, I mean, what a difference, right, it was this year um, back to, I don't want to call it normal, right, because we're still in our third year of being impacted by COVID. But compared to where we were like one year ago, and I mean like today, right? Don't forget, we opened up on the 14th of September last year, I'm sorry, the 15th, and that 14th, that night, I, you know, I mean, at a certain point I was like, it's, but it's gonna happen, so I went home at like 10 o'clock, I think that night, you know, and I said, you know. Um, so, uh, despite some of the things that are in place still related to COVID, uh, it's so refreshing to be back in our own classrooms, to have um, subject matter academic wings rather than grade level wings, have a rotating schedule, drop one, um, you know, a lot of things are happening in person, right? So uh, we were able to have an in-person eighth grade um, freshman orientation, rather, not eighth grade, but freshman orientation. We had an in-person parent university at night at the end of August for our ninth grade parents and any other new families that were new to the, new to the school. Um, sports are off and running and bustling. Um, the musical is already up and running so that after school, our corridors are back and loaded with kids where they always have been. Many of our clubs have already started, not all of them, uh, but student council is well underway, Key Club is well underway, Amnesty International is well underway, men's and women's choir is well underway, so um, I'm really pleased to report that um, Pembroke High School is looking more normal than it has in the past, you know, 20 months or so. Um, we did um, not have a um, significant hiring class for new staff um, this summer. We did bring aboard six, I want to call them new, just because they're new in their positions, but really even them are new to our school. Um, and I think that that's really a credit to the district. I think they've made a commitment to hiring and mentoring and retaining uh, quality educators. Uh, in fact, at the high school, um, 
on the first day of school, we had um, five new staff, I'm sorry, six staff members earn professional teaching status. Um, ben Auger, Kathy Otina, Richard Newton, Jesse Polito, um, Jovan Silva Delgado, and Anthony Fulmine. Um, and so again, that's a sign that, you know, really again, a credit to Mary Beth and her mentoring program um, and, and keeping really quality teachers. Um, we did not have to hire a first year, like new teacher this summer. The people we brought back were either experienced educators um, or they were transferred from another district. So for instance, you, uh, I remain uh, eternally grateful to this committee for reinstating our ARC program after a reduction um, a couple of budget cycles ago and to um, lead the ARC program, Mindy Corshane, uh, who was an English teacher for us for 10 years and, and was reduced. Um, we uh, recalled her back to run the ARC program. A uh, huge win for our, for our school. Um, Anthony Fulmine, who was in the middle school last year, was a long-term sub after being reduced at the high school, is now back here with us as a special education teacher. Um, Widad El Falali was a .6 foreign language teacher um, at the middle school last year. Um, she is now at the high school as a full-time world language teacher. She's teaching um, French and Spanish at the high school. But again, not new to our district and not new to our students. Um, and even some of the, the new faces. Um, we hired Mackenzie McDonald to serve as our compass coordinator. Mackenzie is a graduate of Pembroke High School, graduated in 2016. Uh, and also coaches our field hockey program. So again, while she's new to that position, she's certainly not new to a lot of our staff and our student body. Um, we hired Allison Villano to serve as a .6 nurse. Uh, Allison is a long time resident of Pembroke and has had two students come through the high school so that, uh, again, Allison is no stranger to us. Um, and even uh, Gail Bodoin, uh, a paraprofessional we hired this year, an inclusion paraprofessional. She also is a long time resident of Pembroke. She has a daughter in the school currently right now. So um, lots of familiar faces in the high school, even with the new staff that we brought on board this year. Uh, love is in the air at Pembroke High School. Um, as always, we had um, six teachers get married over the summer. Um, Jess DiPolito, Austin Glass, Sam Turvey, Anthony Fulmine, Ned Gould. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, that's five. And then we had one young man get engaged, DJ Shelter. So um, lots, of, lots of great things happening in our school, for sure. Um, in terms of the goals for the year um, with professional development, um, in addition to the never-ending um, reviewing curriculum documents and materials and assessment strategies, that's always ongoing. Um, as um, Donna had mentioned, the co-teaching uh, initiative continues. Um, at the high school, we have eight sections of co-taught classes, four at the freshman level and four at the sophomore level. As Don alluded to, it's really the four cores, English, math, social studies, science. So one course for each of those subjects uh, per grade. So it's eight total in the ninth and tenth grade. Uh, however, and so most of those teams are veteran teams and they were trained three or four years ago now. Um, I've asked <coughs> Jessica to reach out uh, to Rebus to see if we can get them that next step. I think that the world of COVID, we were making great progress with our co-teaching. We're making great strides, and then COVID kind of hit, and everything, I don't want to say it, it, it didn't go backwards, but it kind of stopped where we were, because we were adjusting our instructional practices for a variety of other reasons, right, with hybrid learning, remote learning, and everything else. Um, I really want to get those folks uh, some new training, some of those next step type trainings this year. Um, but uh, as Donna mentioned, we also had some new teachers at the high school hired who had not yet been trained, so they're part of this, this round of training right here. So. Looking forward to continuing that, that co-teaching program. Um, we are also um, kind of exploring some culturally responsive and inclusive curriculum practices at the high school, um, led by Dr. Galligan and the Humanities Program primarily, uh, including using the culturally responsive curriculum scorecard, looking at our current curriculum documents, uh, and just to see you know, how we measure up with that scorecard of an inclusive and, and uh, representative curriculum. I think that the bulk of our PD will be our next steps in our NEASC decennial accreditation visit. So we are now three years away. They're coming in November of 2024. And that's really when it starts to work. When you're three years out, that's when it really starts to, to come at you quickly. So uh, tomorrow I'm meeting with the high school leadership team and we're gonna officially uh, name our steering committee um, and our accreditation coordinators who are also part of the steering committee. And then once we do that, I reach out to our liaison, um, the 
it shows you what small world, the education world is. Our, li our liaison in uh, FENIASC, her name is Dr. Kathleen Montagano. She was um, my assistant superintendent of the schools when I was first hired in Blackstone Middle High School years ago, 20, 25 plus years ago or so. Uh, so it's, it's a good touch base to her again. So once we contact Dr. Montagano, she comes out in this fall, sometime between now and let's say Thanksgiving. Uh, and she works with our staff at faculty meetings and kind of gives some necessary training to do what's next in those three years, all right? So she all wanted three years for us. What we have to do as a staff uh, between now and November of 2024. So um, that, will, that will be a sizable chunk of what we're doing with the high school for really the next two and a half years, I would say. Four months. Can I jump in on that one? I don't know. Sure. Yeah. Let me jump in on that one. Can you get the final NIASC report to the committee? I know I'm the only one here who got the last one, so I know where our deficiencies were that the they cited. The yeah. yeah. And while we're on this, the uh, my other question on this, we had a long discussion in 2012 or 2011 or 2010, whenever it was, whether we were going to do it or not, because schools weren't going through the NIASC accreditation, it's a tremendous amount of work, and there's also a, some cost. They, they paired back the costs, I think, with the visiting teams and how long and what you have to pay for and all that other stuff. I, I, I think it's important that the committee here, I don't know, did you go through one of these in Carver? I did with Carver, yeah. So you, you know what oh, it's like. It's a process. Yeah, yeah. And, and, I can and you're still, in my mind, having gone through, I think this is the third or fourth one that I've gone through, Went through one at Silver Lake, and then I think that this will be the third one in Pembroke. I still question whether the value for what we get for a return out of it is. It's a good exercise to, to you know self-reflect and have people evaluate you, but there's also still what's the investment, what's the what's the payback. It's just if we could get, I think if we could get that. Yeah. Just, do you want to pick? Timeline I'm, to thinking, have that conversation. I'm thinking November, sure. right? Because that's when you're going to be preparing. Not to get, I don't want to give extra work, but I think it would help yeah. this committee understand what goes into a NIES sure. evaluation. And same thing with the public, because I'm right with different set of parents than we were 10 years ago. Sure, absolutely. That'd be helpful. Sorry, that's okay. Um, and before I move on with teachers, I was remiss. Uh, I, I, I failed to, to mention that we had um, a pretty um, impressive award. One of our teachers earned over the summer from the Massachusetts Association of Science Teachers. Um, they, th that committee gives out a series of awards. One of them is called the Don Sather Exemplary New Teacher Award. It goes to a teacher in his or her first three years of teaching science. Um, and um, they're committed for remarkable achievement, accomplishment, and promise as a science educator. Uh, and I got an email in July that said that our very own Andrew Baker uh, earned that award uh, this summer. So. Very impressive. Andrew Baker is one of the co-teaching um, teachers who is going to the training right now as well. He also was certified to teach AP Chemistry this summer, uh, and he's taken that on as well. So uh, he's an impressive young man for sure. Um, and uh, we're lucky to have him on board. Um, there is a, a whole host of summer, I'm sorry, summer, September programming happening at the high school right now. A lot of it is focused on the seniors, but not exclusively. Um, all last week, Dave Ricks and Kristen Kelly met with um, their classes over a four-day period and had that, you know, beginning of the year class assembly, reviewing the handbook, uh, you know, uh, key points. Um, the class advisors met with them also um, all last week to kind of talk up the fundraising and talk up some of these great events that we want to start bringing back in person, you know, provided we can. Uh, beginning with homecoming, uh, which will be in October. Our homecoming weekend is October 15th and 16th. The football game was on the 15th and the, um, the dance on the 16th. We are planning for an indoor and an outdoor event, depending on uh, where we're gonna be standing. If we are masked, uh, the kids are gonna wanna go outside for that, like we were for the prom, planning for the prom, okay? And so uh, we are working right now with the council to, uh, to have uh, either scenario or not. Okay. Um, they're talking about things like the prom, of course, right? junior prom this year will be at the Seacrest down at Falmouth uh, for the second year now. So even with our freshman class, we have started to talk to them about, well, junior year may seem a long way away. The, the planning and the hard work for the prom is starting right now. They have to book an event by the spring of their sophomore year. We need a deposit for that and everything else. So it's been a really good week to have those in-person assemblies with our students to communicate all of this to them. Um, 
we reviewed our emergency responses, right? Shelter in place, community alerts, lockdowns. We were able to do all that again this year um, and, and give it some real um, attention it deserves. But back to the seniors though, right? So a lot of our programming this, this fall is for the seniors, beginning with uh, our senior seminars that our guidance department is running starting today, uh, all of this, the rest of this week, and then all of next week, where they're gonna talk about the college admission process with them. And then we have our college fair um, it's on the 23rd. We have 100 schools coming to our gymnasium on the 23rd in the morning of the 23rd. Um, Mark, is that September or October? September? All this is September. September, yeah. 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 sure, thank you. Yeah. The South Shore um, Guidance Lighthouse Consortium uh, is working together to bring programming to schools throughout the South Shore and uh, Hanover High School is really taking the lead on that. This is all in the guidance newsletter that Karen Goff sent out this week, but uh, there are some uh, virtual webinars for senior families, parents of seniors, um, that deal with the financial aid process, that deal with the college essay writing, a separate seminar for the uh, college essay writing. Um, there's one for the college um, planning overview in general, all right, for families. This is all stuff that we do in school with the students, but the families also need to, I think, hear that so they can help support that process. So all, all of that stuff is happening um, for our seniors. It's really starting right now. All right, so the parents of seniors, it's good to kind of keep that in mind. We will be running our own college um, financial aid night in October. Virtual again, but uh, Ms. Jody Conway, who's been in our school for many, many years, running this night, will be doing it in October as well. So lots of good things happening. And like I said earlier, it's glad to, I'm glad that we're just doing it in the building and just you know seeing each other and, and uh, having that commotion. It's a good, that's a good thing. Yeah, well, we just talked a little bit about clubs. Since that participation is what we would hope for, I, I know we talked about fees and things, and has that been on track? It ha It is been on track, and uh, you know the fee structure is such that the first one there is no charge for that, right? It's not for the second club. So right now, because it's new, there aren't many kids that are more than one right now. So. The sign-ups for a lot of other clubs have not happened yet, so I would imagine that that's going to start ramping up a little bit. Um, but we're pre pre prepared to help families for whom that may be an issue. Because right? so, we don't want that to certainly um, you know, to yeah. 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 Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Nope. Just got actually, three things real quick. Um, actually, it's not you, but for Donna and Mike and Ben. Um, when we, we talked, Mark talked about part of the seniors, but if you look at right, the eighth graders, they lost out on everything from six, seven, and eight. Um, and you don't have to answer. I'm just if we cannot forget the sixth graders and the eighth graders. Right? I, you, I know you know this, but just I, I'm sure as open houses come, you're going to be getting the questions from parents, and rightly so, just so that we're prepared for it under every scenario. I've been asked a couple times, what are we thinking? And unfortunately, with the way things have gone the last month, I don't know if we can plan much further than a couple of weeks, but just so that they know you're thinking about it, because I think that, I, well, I know it's important to them. So that's just the one thing. The actually second thing real quick, I think if I counted correctly when you talked about new staff members across the board, I think there were at least five Pembroke High School graduates in there, uh, which- Julia Eisen also is a um, high school graduate. Oh, I didn't even, okay. So, so that's even six. So, so I, think that's, I think that's pretty important, because when we started the high school, uh, geez, 2006, um, so, you know, I think that was the, was. This is year 17. This is year 17. That's why I have to count this. Year 17. We yeah. out, but it's the first, geez, I got to count year books. Well, so so <laughs> but the, I guess the, the point is, we're, this is what we're getting out of it. And people were concerned when we withdrew that we wouldn't be able to do some of the things that we've done, right? You talked about the drama pieces. You talked about the club pieces. And we've been able to kind of come full circle with, you know some of the some of the students. I know three of them that got mentioned with class of 2016, which I think is kind of neat. With this so I think that's important to know, um, which is great. Great job to everyone along the way. The last question I have, and I know I know we've had some bus issues, so I have two questions around it. One, because I saw the emails go out, if you could just address it. And second, because I actually saw Tracy Marino post a couple things. First, student 
Yep. So there's a national bus driver yep. shortage. I, know. I was going to say, how can we be a good partner okay. to help support them yes. because they ultimately support us? Yes. So. Um, so we are fortunate to have a first student lot here in Pembroke. Um, we, we receive a tremendous amount of collaboration with first student on many of our events outside of just traditional being our bus provider. Um, so there is a national bus driver shortage. Many of you have seen in the news that the National Guard has been activated to help with that. Um, I'm not sure that that will trickle its way to Pembroke. Our routes are fully covered at this time, but there are no backup drivers. So there is definitely um, a plea out there for anybody interested in bus driving to um, reach out to first student and get started in the process. We have um, traditionally had the first couple days of school um, with our bus routes be kind of a learning experience at the elementary level in particular because it's not a you don't have to pay to ride the bus there are oftentimes students that are outside to ride the bus that aren't necessarily registered yet so it takes a couple of days um, for those routes and lists to, to settle a little bit there are a couple of buses here at north that have traditionally arrived to school late I think last year was just a different year for everybody and that wasn't on the top of everybody's kind of list. I know exactly which buses they are. Um, Lori, our Jacobs, our transportation coordinator, has been working with first student to make adjustments to that route. We've moved stops off of that bus route. We have um, changed the time that the route has started. So there has been some significant improvement in the arrival time here at North. So these two buses in particular were arriving at 8.45 or 8.50 when school here starts at 8.35. So that is definitely a concern. Um, those buses have been, again, continually monitored. Today, the bus arrived at 8.38, which is better, but still not perfect. Um, there are some larger scale switches that we're looking at, um, moving a couple of students that are pretty far off of the route onto another route to save some additional time. Also, there is a whole lot of road construction happening here in Pembroke. Um, so the bus for here in North in particular is unable to take a right out of Habermock Ice Arena down, I mean, is that Monroe right there? So she's having to go all the way around, which adds six minutes to the route. So once that construction is done, six minutes will be shaved off the route. But again, um, there is a bus 14 here at North has continually been an issue. We are working with first student the, and the driver to minimize the disruptions to the route, but get the route here on time. Um, so again, over the past five days, there have been a number of adjustments that have been made, and there's still two more longer term adjustments that we're working on right now. Is that impacted after school at all? Or? So after school is a little bit different. Not all kids take the bus home on the secondary routes after school, so the routes after school are a little bit shorter. So there, so the buses that come to North do a, a high school, middle school run in either a Hobblebuck or a Bryanville run. So and as far as sports or late buses and things like that? Yeah, no. Uh, so there's 26 buses, not all of them route to North as a third tier, so we're able to use them for um, our other other needs. Sorry, right here. Why there's one more? Because um, I heard actually Darlene talked about some of the social emotional pieces, the psychologist that's the intern. Is it possible we get the interrupted learning update in October and December? We, we have metrics, I'm not saying from last year, but can we go back to, to two years ago or three years ago and look at the metrics? Are we seeing an increase in the number of students looking for services? Just so that we can understand, because one of the things we talked about during budget was potential additional support for those students. And that's why we saved some of the ESSER and CARES money. So I just I think it's important for us to know, do we need to act in October or December based upon what we see for data? Absolutely. Is that fair? To that end, we didn't talk about the, the wonderful emotional support, though. That's correct, Mr. Kidd. That's right, yes. Um, so one of our licensed uh, social workers, Rachel McGowan, um, took the time and her personal resources um, to have her, her dog her, um, certified as a therapy dog. Um, and we got it cleared through Erin and this committee to uh, have Bauer um, at our school starting next week. And the plan is to ease him in and, and, and likewise ease our students into the process, maybe one or two days per week early on, with the, obviously with the goal of increasing that incrementally so that Eventually, he'll be at five days a week with Rachel. Um, the dog will be with Rachel at all times. Um, initially, Bao will be part of her already pre-planned pre counseling sessions with the students on her caseload or Holly Gary's caseload. Um, we don't envision uh, rolling out Bao in the general population uh, until certainly mid-fall, if not then. It's all about getting one acclimated and getting the established. Trying to find the best way to allow the general 
um, student body to have access to the home. Uh, she's very excited about that. I'm very excited about that. But she's been work, um, um, working for a long time to, to make this a reality. So um, congratulations to Rachel for doing that. And thank you for this committee for supporting that endeavor. And you'll remember a few years back we had Bodie, the therapy dog, visit us. He was so tired after his day at school. I think he just slept on the floor yeah. the entire time. But um, we, we are not new to having a therapy dog in the schools. But in the small world category, my sister is a dog walker. She does for a living, and she walks Rachel's dog. And they didn't, we did not know this until about two months later they were just talking. And she said, did you ask him tell him? Did you put a mock tell She goes, who's, who's asking? What do you want to know? You know so, uh, and my sister uh, confirms that Bowie is a super, super dog. Mark, are there breaks put in for the dogs? Only because we're involved with the dogs. It, it's stressful, and I'm thinking of the volume of students. I mean, they, because we don't want to see a dog break. Either. For sure. Yeah. And so Rachel, as part of all this, is also a certified dog handler, right? So she she knows all about, you know, when it's too much, when to back off, breaks, and things. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot, as we've contemplated. That's why I was like, I know there are breaks in there. I just, I guess, really, how will we train the general population so they understand that sometimes? Because I, I know I didn't know that until we started exploring it, and it, their dogs get stressed, too. So that's just it's all part of our training. We awesome. did have a Vidaya uh, come um, periodically, yeah. and uh, so Holly and Rich so great, were great with that as well. And, and even though he was only here for quick, quick hits, they had uh, a very organized and controlled um, routine for everyone to access the dogs, so that no one's getting tired, no one's you know causing commotion. Well, thanks things. for doing this. this that's, thanks that's to awesome. Rachel. It was, really, it was all her. That's and, terrific. Yeah. yeah, that's fantastic. Can go if you want. You don't have to stay. I know you have to get up early. So thank you. Thanks, thanks for coming, folks. Have a great night. Absolutely. Absolutely. To the principals. I'm, I'm sorry. I'll make them quick if I may. Um, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Maureen JC. I'm a parent in the school system, and I know many of you. And mm -hmm. nice to see all of you. Um, if I, you touched on many of the things I want to speak on, but I just want to say quickly. Um, the buildings, I've been in many of them, and they look beautiful, and I just wanted to support, again, thank you for whoever is listening who's responsible for the, thank you, they, they just, they're lovely to send your child to a clean school. It's really noticed and appreciated, thank you. Um, also, again, um, I saw the best smile on my son's face when he saw that basketball court outside North. Isn't that great? Mm -hmm. That's been done in the hoops. It's been a dream of his, yep. so thank you again. Spencer Fetishfield did a great job on that. And I don't know, but my bus experience has been remarkable this year, so thank you. Um, I'm waiting for the butt. But yeah. <laughs> 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 so, we live on West Elm. West Elm has traditionally been a tough bus route, so yeah. I'm glad that we. <laughs> yeah, it's been great. It's been great. I do have three things that might bring up some discussion, so I don't know how you'd like to handle no, them. Go, but, go ahead. Um, one is lockers in the middle school. Yep. Um, my eighth grader, um, speaking to you as those poor eighth graders have been, you know, everything's been, unfortunately, they miss their Borndale, they miss their, if they could maybe have a locker, could you maybe reconsider it? Um, so the locker conversation was part of the adjustments to the PCMS student handbook. It is not relative to COVID. Um, what we learned last year from our experience, and Donna can hit on this, is that our teachers reported that students were much more ready for class when they were carrying their materials with them. Um, it, it's quite a distraction at the secondary level to use a locker. I know many high school students, though they're assigned a locker, nobody uses it because they're unable to get to the locker and get materials during the amount of time allotted for passing. Um, in years past, on some of my visits to the middle school, I can say that Mary Beth, Jess, and myself have seen our guidance counselors working with students on locker organization. Um, being a mother of a middle school boy, I can totally appreciate that. Um, but I, I do think teachers found that they were able to get students in the seats and starting to learn faster when they were carrying their materials versus the backpack, well, versus the locker. But I'm happy, Donna, yeah, if you so want to open that. I totally understand that. Like, oh, sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, I totally understand that. So many things have changed piece to it and the moment, right? So um, we were surprised. Um, I was surprised at how much feedback I got through all the year from teachers, like how much more organized students were. They were surprised that materials weren't getting lost. They weren't chasing materials. Their students weren't leaving the classroom all the time. Like, I got to go to my locker, and then they can't open the combination lock, and then, and then whatever. So it, 
Yeah. So you know, if I, you know, I really was working with my teachers on trying to make sure that um, we had a, you know, we did lockers or not used lockers make sense. Um, it certainly makes it a little more efficient as far as them getting to class and um, you know, not in the hallways as much. I certainly I talked to tours a little bit and for, more for seventh grade parents because we had more seventh grade parents on tours. Um, I'm thinking that maybe we get a little bit further into the year because there always is a big adjustment of secondary for all the students. Potentially having lockers come back potentially just for outerwear or something. Well, that that is my actually my motivating force. Although my children probably um, that's the biggest argument like why wear your coat. Well, yeah. you know, last year was well I have nowhere to put it and I'm not carrying it around the school yeah, all day. So, so I can relate. You know, I can give them yeah. that, but. Um, you know, it is a it is a an annoyance that they do take time to learn that padlock, but it's a level of responsibility that you know that they need to kind of learn and, and be responsible to organize yourself, and, and it's a responsibility, and they, you know, it's something they have to kind of try to meet. So, I understand the academic yeah. concerns and the, and the pros to that, but yeah. maybe with the winter coming, if you could consider considering I, yeah, it. Yeah, actually, during tours, I had mentioned that. To so when I would, whatever it was I ran, I had mentioned it that like, you know, maybe we get to like the colder weather we may have them. And if we do that, it would really be about um, them putting their outerwear, potentially, because again, we got to think about mass breaks and if it's cold, because they're out all the time. Um, it would really be a beginning of the day and the end of the day, because we really want to have the students not put materials in their lockers, because we, we try to keep the supply list as compressed as possible with how many kids they have, with how many classes they have, that they need the stuff in their locker, in the backpack. There's nothing they, they need their binder, like they need it every single class. They need their Chromebook. Um, they don't need 50 pence. Um, they don't need, you know, five Says you. sheets of paper. Thank so there you. are ways, and I did ask, um, I did ask my teachers um, at the last faculty meeting, we talked about lockers and the bulk of, you know, the, the backpacks and was there ways. So they're looking at it like some of the kids are now leaving their lunch, if they, if they take a lunch, they're leaving the lunch boxes in the room. Um, I think some of the size of the binders, particularly for some very eager seventh graders, um, were um, very large. I think most, a lot more eighth graders really had a better sense on the size probably. So we're looking at that and I'm purchasing some binders too so if kids have really large ones, we can offer them the option, right? Because I don't want to take it away from them if they love that binder, but saying, here's another size that would really do you too um, if you find in the bulk of your thing. So, it's totally on my radar. We're aware of it. I'm working with the staff on it, and um, it's definitely something I'll consider when we get to Appreciate your efforts and concern. Thank Absolutely. you so much. Yeah. Principal Tell, if I might, I, I want to let you guys go as soon as you can. Principal, one second. Can we get an update at the second yep. October meeting? Yep. That way you, you have it. I, just, awesome. I didn't want to get past that. Yep. So yep. we'll put it on for the second October meeting to get an update on lockers. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Sorry. And, go ahead. And um, you again spoke, Principal Talbot, to um, the upcoming events for the homecoming and so forth. And, um, they, um, I became aware of an Instagram that the Pembroke High School uh, Student Council um, posted on Instagram um, message. I, I have it. I could reach if you'd like, but I, I'd save you that time. But basically, it was um, incentivizing other students to, I would say, maybe pressuring to get vaccinated so that they could possibly have a prom. And I was wondering um, who governs that Instagram, um, and did the school, were you aware of that? Was it dictated from you all to encourage people to get vaccinated? Sure. so I'm happy to start first and then let Mark Thank you. In. So the Instagram post that you, you have, we have also seen, it is, not the, it is not the Pembroke High School Student Council Instagram that it came from. It is a student's private account. Um, I think Mark will hop in, but part of the grade level assemblies that he discussed that um, Dave Ricks and Kristen Kelly had with students last week focused on the point that vaccination rates and vaccination status do not correlate to our ability to have events at the high school and making that clear to students. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the post, but. Sure, um, and I, I do appreciate you bringing that up here in this forum so for clarity's sake. Um, you know, I think that the students who may have either posted that or I don't know how Instagram works, but called tag it or whatever, <laughs> it, whatever it is. You sound really smart right now. <laughs> <laughs> they certainly had the best intentions in mind. Their intention was not to pressure or to um, try to make people think that uh, someone were responsible for us not getting vaccinated. We met with those students in my office. Um, they were certainly um, very uh, worried about the impression that they were giving off. And so um, I think it was an innocent mistake for sure. That happened very early in the school year. I think it was the second or first day of school. Um, 
our class meetings that I just referenced with the assistant principals were already scheduled to happen the following week. Uh, and the very first few slides of that presentation um, were just about that topic, that um, with, as the student body, we should not be asking each other about vaccination status, we should not be giving the impression that, you know, if you don't, then this will kind of thing. Uh, as I was saying to the committee here tonight, the homecoming is going to be happening. We're gonna have, if we have to go outside to have, we'll go outside to have. In fact, I think the kids want to go outside to have it so they can take their masks off. Um, it'll be a nice, um, hopefully a nice fall night to do it. So um, to me, it was a learning experience, a learning uh, teachable moment for those kids um, and, um, and for all of our students. And um, I, you know, again, once Dave and Chris spoke to each of the classes um, the following week, you know, I, I hope that we resolved that issue. Thank you very much for addressing it and, um, and taking action, I appreciate it. And I also want to say thank you so much for supporting um, the children and having a homecoming and making all efforts to make that happen for them. It's very important for them. Thank you're you so welcome. much. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, um, I'm sorry, that was all I have. Um, there was one thing that came up with the report that kind of concerned me, if you could just speak um, to the fundraising. Um, if the fundraiser for a mask has been set in stone, if not, could maybe some discussion be raised at whatever is appropriate. Um, it's kind of a dividing topic, and maybe a fundraiser could be um, something that's not such dividing. It would be more profitable, maybe. I'm um, sorry, I missed something. Sure. sure. When we've done the Gold Gold fundraiser before, we've done it at the high school um, in years past, and it's been those silicone bracelets. There's there's a multitude of things that they could they could fundraise with. It doesn't necessarily have to be a mask. We can talk about yeah. um, some alternatives. And it also so that. Can be donation. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You guys can go. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. Let me just check the mailbox. Sorry. <laughs> There's nothing. All right. Um, so I'm just going to go through a couple of slides. Some of it is repetitive. Um, some of it is uh, follow-up information from the conversation that we had the last time. Um, I have updated some of the slides that are in your packet just with, with today's accurate information as far as um, case counts and whatnot. So. Just to go over the mask guidelines, we have had a couple of families have some conversations with our school medical professionals, so our school nurses, around the type of masks that students are being asked to wear. So this graphic here comes from the CDC website and talks about what a mask, what the mask guidelines are. So the mask should cover an individual's nose and mouth. If you hold the mask up to the light, it should you shouldn't be able to filter light through it. It should be snug around the ears, all of those. So this is just a helpful graphic that is also on our website going over what the mask guidelines are for the CDC. At our last meeting, we talked about legal opinions and what would happen if the Pembroke School District chose not to follow the masking requirements set forth by DESA. But this was the, the reason These are, whether they can or not. Right. Yeah. So we talked about both that as well as the legal requirements, the legal opinion on whether DESE has the ability to institute a mask requirement. So when we spoke last time, I had in my hand that night, which became public record, the Long and DPHO um, legal opinion, which is posted to our website. Um, I discussed verbally the legal opinion from our school council, Emerson and Emerson out of Westwood, um, and at the request of the committee, received a third legal opinion from Murphy, Lamory, and Murphy in Braintree. Um, all three legal opinions are of the same mind that DESE does have the ability to institute a mask requirement. They all cite Chapter 69, Section 1, 1A and 1B, which talks about the duties um, and responsibilities both of the board and the commissioner. Um, it also talks about their uh, ability to do so when there's a state of emergency, which we all know there is not currently a state of emergency, but what exigent circumstances look like. So there is a snippet here of what um, Chapter 69, Section 1, 1A and 1B says. The legal opinions, the additional two ones from Emerson and Emerson and Murphy, Lamory Murphy, will be posted to the website following this meeting. And there was no Long Meadow decision. So the East Long Meadow School Committee meeting that was referenced at the last meeting that we had on August 31st and the suggestion that we take a look at the Long Meadow case. There is not a case in Long Meadow. So during public comment, a parent of a Long Meadow student who was also an attorney gave a public comment discussing whether or not it was his opinion whether DESE had the ability to institute a mask mandate. He was not representing the school committee at the time. He does not represent the school committee of East Long Meadow. 
Um, so there is no legal case or legal opinion from East Longmeadow to follow up on. Okay. Just want to make, just want to make sure yeah. people were aware when we closed that one. So the second part of the conversation on August 31st was what happens if we don't follow it. Um, at the request of the committee, I did contact Commissioner Jeff Riley and ask, uh, blatantly asked, what happens if we don't do it? Um, so there are a couple of steps to what, what the repercussions of non-compliance would be. The first step um, would be to get the district into compliance. And the way that's done is by um, opening a case with the Attorney General's office. He has the right to do that under Mass General Law Chapter 69, Section 1B. Um, here you can see right there what the responsibilities of the board are. If you continue to not comply with the mask mandate, as we talk, discussed before, the board can withhold state and federal funds from the school district. So this is all state and federal funds. It is not just the additional COVID cares and ESSER money that people are talking about. This is chapter 70. This is our federal entitlement grants like Title I, IDEA, um, Title IV, all of those grants. They have the ability to withhold all of that if the district is non-compliant. And the last, as I alluded to before, I did sign an attestation as superintendent saying that we would follow the um, masking requirement, so there is there is the potential to suspend licensure. Again, the least of the concerns. The, the, the biggest concern is about the withholding of funding from the district. Um, when we talked about what the funding was for the district, our chapter um, 70 funding is just under 14 million. We received monthly payments um, from the state of Massachusetts, from the, the government for those, um, for chapter 70, that's just, just about 1.15 million a month, um, so not participating or not adhering to the masking requirement would jeopardize those funds. Those funds come, on, come in on the last day of each month. Here are the funds that we talked about. So chapter 70 again runs July to June, 12 monthly installments. There's state and federal grants. In addition, as a district, we have taken advantage of all of the CARES and coronavirus relief funds that were available last year. That totaled a little over $1.6 million and we have the potential to take advantage of an additional $1.6 million through 2024. For anyone that has been, been part of this process, as we've discussed our budget both last year and in previous year, years, we've talked about looking at funding opportunities for multiple year um, strategies. And so having access to funds that go into 2024 allow us flexibility in our budgeting, not just this year or next year, but three years out. Talking a little bit about the health data. So this is the health data um, as of today. It is updated from the slides you all have in your packet. We currently have 10 active student cases in Pembroke Public Schools. We've had 19 student cases total. So in an enrollment of 2,577, again, that is as of today. The enrollment will fluctuate a little bit over the next couple days. That, is, that re represents 0.7% um, of the population has um, contracted COVID in the eight days of school. We have had four staff cases, three active cases um, as of right now, but four total cases. No student school-based transmission has been found. Um, I spoke with Lisa before the meeting. Unfortunately, Lisa wasn't able to join us tonight. She had another meeting. Um, there are no current hospitalizations for Pembroke residents um, associated with COVID. Talking a little bit about municipal vaccination rates as we start to get closer to that October 1 date and that 80% number that DESE has alluded to as the waiver tipping point. Um, uh, the municipal vaccination rates are reported every Thursday, so this information is what was reported on Thursday, September 9th. Again, we'll get another report um, in the next two days. As you can see there, our 16 to 19 year old population is at 80%, um, and our 12 to 15 population is growing. I believe it says 57% right now, so that's up from 53% the week before. What's the the 5%. So that is what they represent from the total population. So 5% of the population of Pembroke is between the ages of 12 and 15. I wanted to go over protocols. Now that we are a few days into school and we have had some cases um, of COVID in, in the school, some instances are obviously students haven't been present. Some instances students have been present during, during the infectious period. So as we've discussed a couple of times what a close contact is. So close contacts are defined as any individual that has been in six feet of space of a COVID-19 positive case for more than 15 minutes cumulatively in a 24 hour period. You'll remember that following the DESE masking requirement, the CDC, the DPH and DESE came out with close contact 
definitions that stated at three feet of spacing with masks, there would be no classroom-based contact tracing in schools. So if students are three feet apart and they are masked, there are no close contacts. Lisa and I have both talked with all of you collectively about the fact that there are obviously exceptions to that rule. So when we're talking about some of our special ed programs where the teachers and the students are closer together at all times, where mask wearing adherence isn't always 100%, some of our lower elementary grades, then there's often just instances in other general education settings where students are closer than three feet apart. So anytime there is a positive case of a student or staff, the school nurse works directly with the staff. So I've got a lot of conversations on who does the contact tracing in school. It is our school nurse. She works directly with the teacher in the classroom if it's a student case, directly with the staff member if it's a staff case to identify any students or staff that have been within that three feet for the 15 minutes or more. And I have to stress this, we err on the abundant side of caution. So if there is somebody that, you know, maybe it was 15 minutes, maybe it was 12 minutes, we include them when we're contact tracing. There are times when our students are unmasked. So anytime a classroom has an indoor snack, an indoor lunch or an indoor mask break. They are within six feet of space and unmasked, so automatically the students around them are close contacts. We have seating charts for each and every one of those instances, and the nurses go over them if we have a, a contact positive in school. Our staff here at North Pembroke, at all of our schools, are aware of the spacing requirements. They are mindful of the protocols. I know if, if you walked in this way, you walked by, couple of first grade rooms, maybe some second grade rooms. If you came in this way, you walked by some kindergartens and some preschools. They are mindful of those protocols in their seating arrangements. They're mindful of those protocols when they're planning their activities for students. I can understand and appreciate that oftentimes teachers um, use Instagram for their class or um, Google Classroom or Seesaw to communicate with families in their snapshots of the day. Those are just that, a snapshot of the day. It is not necessarily representative of what, of what the six and a half hour day the student looks like for the student in front of us. So I have seen the Snapchats too, I have seen the Instagram posts. I would just assure you all that our staff is very mindful of the protocols and keep, those, keep that in mind when they are planning. And in times when, when they are, do have student groupings that are at less than three feet, those student and that information is included when they're working with a nurse on contact tracing. So when it comes to quarantining, we've been through this a couple times before. Um, identified asymptomatic close contacts may quarantine for the CDC guidance or participate in our test and stay program. I'm happy to say that our test and stay program is up and running. Um, we have used it at four of the five schools at this point. Um, you know, I, I think we've had no additional positive cases or tests from the test and stay program. But for those that are not, um, so for those that are vaccinated, there is no quarantine or testing requirement. Quarantining if you're asymptomatic and not wanting to test, you can return after 10 days. If you want to test but you don't want to participate in test and stay, you can test um, after day five and return after day eight. So there's been a couple of questions around why are they testing five days in school for test and stay? So the, the magic five day number at school represents the full seven day quarantine outlined by DESE. So if you are including five days of school testing. The recommendation is that identified asymptomatic close contacts quarantine on weekends and non-school days. That gets folks to the seven days with the return to, to um, regular learning on day eight. As again, regular being defined as no longer being identified as a close contact. Some information on how we communicate. Anybody that has been identified as, as a school-based close contact receives noti notification directly from the school nurse. We report our COVID-19 cases through our COVID dashboard. This has been the same way we have been reporting for over a year now. The dashboard is the most accurate information available at the time. It gets updated as new information comes available that is at least daily and at sometimes multiple times a day. But what I wanna to stress to families in particular is if you have specific concerns about your student, let's, I, you, we, I'm a mom, my kids go to school, they come home and say this or that or the other. If, you're, if your child is saying something to you that doesn't sit right with you, pick up the phone and call the school nurse. She is more than happy to have a conversation with you about your child in the setting, what it means for them with somebody with a close contact. But that's the best resource is the school nurse. Pick up the phone and call her. We have amazing school nurses in all five of our buildings. They are happy and willing to talk to anybody that has questions. This is scary as a parent. We all up here as parents understand that. But the best resource for you is your school nurse. 
do is I'll go to the committee. If you would like to ask questions or sign in, just sign in. I'll grab that as soon as we get to almost the last member. And then I'll grab that and go with the microphone and ask away, okay? So with that, let me go this way and then we'll end with Sue. And so we'll start with you and then. Sure. Aaron, I, I think just for clarity on the communication piece, I'll let you get it set. Yep. And I'll try to do my best to talk this way. Um, and I know things have changed, and maybe this is the answer to my own question. Um, That's really, helpful when you guys answer your own questions. It, it's, uh, it, it tries. Um, since this sort of new change in the in the close contacts and that piece, did that change? I felt like we were getting community. Sure. Um, with the changes, we used to, I felt like we got more of a group that someone in the school was exposed or had positive tests and I felt like that was a more of a larger range email that used to go out. Sure. So when we started at the beginning of the last school year, I sent out what was known as community notification, saying somebody in the North Pembroke community has tested positive. Yeah. Didn't discern whether it was a student or staff member. Correct. Didn't discern the grade level. Um, what happened with that was people were getting multiple emails in a day as information became available. In addition, many of our families have students in more than one building. So that became a point where the information was overwhelming for folks to manage. Um, at the same time, I think people have had a different experience with the close contact notification of a positive case. So when the CDC changed their guidance on April 20th of 2021, that folks that were within three feet, but, or within six feet, but more than three feet, were no longer a close contact that needed to quarantine. At the time, our protocol changed to the point where we were notifying folks that they were at, le at least three feet, but less than six feet of a positive case, and that they were supposed to monitor for symptoms, but there was no quarantining requirements. The CDC has, again, changed their guidance, and the guidance states three feet with a mask is not a close contact, so. Great, yeah. thank you. Anybody else? David? Uh, actually, just one quick question, Aaron. The cases we have reported in Pembroke, and again, I'm not sure what we can report or not report, are there any of them family clusters where it's, you know, a kid in the elementary school, a kid in the junior high, that type of thing? We have had a couple of um, siblings that have tested positive. Sometimes siblings span more than one building. Sometimes they're both in elementary school. Um, what we're seeing for positive cases are household originate, origination. origination. Um, I'll take that for Lisa. So we're families, when they're contacting tracing with the public health nurse, Nancy Funder, they're talking about a mother or a father that was positive first and then the student being positive. Um, we haven't had any, um, you know, we have no idea how our kid got COVID type conversations. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I have a few questions and I'll go fairly quickly. Um, so the source for the dashboard is Maven and you can't update it until the so there's two, yeah, there's two sources for the dashboard, Maven as well as our school nurses. So before we move somebody from active to recovered, we want to make sure that they've returned to school and that they have improvement in symptoms. So though at 10 days they are technically recovered, we want to make sure that they're recovered. Let me ask a question more yep. specifically then. To get on an active case, yep. it has to be in Maven. To come off of it, it has to be somebody returning to school. Um, not necessarily. Okay. Um, so we do, some of our school nurses do get information about active cases prior to the Maven upload. Um, so I think at one point last week, Maven was about two to three days behind on reporting. Okay. Um, families are great with communication with the school nurse and share when they have positive test results. So we do update based off of that. Um, this week in particular, Maven was down for Saturday and Sunday. Okay. So the information that our school nurses had on Monday morning was much more accurate than what um, even the town-wide dashboard was reporting for the weekend. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So just I want to make sure we go over the quarantine rules and we're clear because I know there's some misinformation and I want to correct it. It's probably a misunderstanding. Um, only people who are deemed a close contact are notified. Right, so the only people that receive individual notification from the school, and that being the school nurse, are those that meet the threshold for a close contact. Again, that is someone that has been within three feet for 15 minutes or more cumulatively over 24 hour period of a COVID-19 positive individual during their infectious period. So infectious period is defined as the 48 hours prior to the onset of symptoms if you're symptomatic, or 48 hours prior to the positive test result if you're asymptomatic. So if you do not meet that bar, you do not get individual notification from our school nurse. But I want to stress again, 
when we contact Trace, we do it with an abundance of caution. So if there's somebody that a teacher feels like, oh, I'm not sure, maybe, we include them. We want to make sure that families have the accurate information. I know a lot of us have older kids that can talk to us about what the day looked like, and a lot of us have younger kids that can't necessarily say, you know, I feel like this, or I, I know this, and, I, and this makes me uncomfortable. So we do do it with the abundance of caution. Okay. So, again, I want something you said earlier. If a parent has a question on close contact, the best person to go to is the nurse who did contact tracing. And if they have additional information or they have a question and they want somebody to look into somebody else being in close contact, the nurse is the place to go. The nurse is the place to go, but understand that the nurses are also have a, a requirement to maintain confidentiality. So everybody might know who the person in the room that's positive is, but the nurse can never tell you who that person is. But she's more than happy to work with you through the situation that your child is part of to, de to help determine whether or not, you know what, it, it makes sense. You know, we do have test and stay tests here in the district. We have many of them at each of the schools. It does not take but two seconds to test somebody with the test and stay protocol. If there is somebody that didn't necessarily rise to our level of close contact, but after a conversation with a parent, there is some concern, we'd absolutely include them in the test and state protocol. The, the intent here is, is to keep kids in school and not have them home quarantined and in sick. So. Um, so, as of today or as of yesterday, or when is the, let me ask the question differently. Close contacts are notified how quickly after identification? So as soon as we have a confirmed positive case, the nurse starts contact tracing. Um, unfortunately, with folks that are asymptomatic, a confirmed case takes a little bit of time, right? Because you're not showing symptoms, there isn't a, a catalyst for you to go and get tested. So as soon as we're aware of the case, the nurse starts working on the contact tracing and families are notified within the same day. Okay, um, two last questions and these should be quick. Do we have a timeline for another DESE call or a governor press conference or a DESE news conference or something? so that we can get some more information because they've been silent. It seems right, like so we had um, heard, hoped to hear this week about what the waiver would look like. We have not yeah, heard anything. Um, there is not a um, call with DESE scheduled for this week. Um, it doesn't mean that he won't um, set up some emergency meeting, which we have had in the past, but there is not a current call scheduled for that purpose. Sure, so we had talked last time about DESE saying that when a um, school building reached an 80% vaccination rate for students and staff, there was a waiver that the school committee could sign off on um, to allow vaccinated individuals to unmask. Um, we have not seen the details of the waiver. I think the last time I talked a little bit about what my concerns on what that practice could look like, you all talked a little bit about your concerns, and we also got some feedback from family concerns, um, but we do not have um, a, a paper copy of what the waiver is at this point. There's, there's nothing in there about how do we collect. Or Are we collecting vaccination records? Is it an honor system? Or how do you determine right. 80%? No. So we don't, right? So 16 to the 16 to 19 population is at 80%, but obviously students over 18 aren't necessarily in our building. And our high school does house students that are 14 and 15 as well. So um, in order to really accurately determine whether or not we have 80%, we would need to collect vaccination records, which is something we don't want to necessarily be in the business of and need some guidance from DESE on what that is supposed Rather to look like. Rather than just saying a building vaccinated, they gave us specific ages, and the specific ages don't align with one particular building which is one of probably frustrating item number 192. <laughs> so that's what we're trying to navigate through. So that was all I had because I wanted to vote the way it was not asked question. So thank you. Susie. I think you hit a lot of them because we were, <clears throat> we were talking about the test and stay. Did, you said four of our five schools are now. Right, we have not needed knock on some kind of wood, the test and stay program at Bryantville as of yet, though that nurse has the tests, has the supplies and materials, has the training and, and can institute it if needed. Um, we do have a test and stay situation here at North, one at Habermock, one at Bryant, I mean one at the middle school and one at the high school. And then the test and stay, they, they're five days in but they quarantine the weekend as well? Yeah, so let's say you were identified as a close count contact on Friday. Um, you would test and stay for Friday. You would quarantine on Saturday and Sunday. You'd test and stay Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So you and have five school eight. days. That gets you to the seven quarantine, quarantine days as outlined by asymptomatic close contacts with the ability to return to normal on day eight. In all instances, you are supposed to monitor for symptoms for 14 days, regardless of vaccination, unvaccinated, or asymptomatic. Okay, and then 
just, I know you're not having DESA related school, and I'm talking loud, I just want to make sure you can hear. I don't know about anybody else, but I feel like my ears are clogged. I think it's the change in season, so I, I apologize. I'm even louder tonight, so thank you for putting up with me. But how are we comparing? Are you able to have conversations? Have you had superintendent conversations with the surrounding districts, and, and how are they making out? And I guess. Sure. Um, so, yes, we talk as superintendents quite regularly, weekly, um, if not more frequently than that. I will say as a district, Pembroke is in a better place than a lot of our closest neighbors when it comes to test and stay, though a lot of school committees voted to participate in test and stay. Pembroke is one of the only ones around here that is up and running. A lot of districts don't have the test or they don't have a coordinator. Um, so I am happy to say that we are able to offer that to families that want to participate as a way to keep students in school um, as opposed to disrupting for quarantining. Um, as far as cases, our demographic is very similar to our surrounding towns. Um, you know, our vaccination rates um, at the, the secondary level are a little bit lower than, let's say, a Hanover, but greater than a Kingston. So we're kind of in the middle of the pack for vaccination rates there. Um, there's some conversation about um, holding a vaccine clinic at one of the schools, which, you know, potentially makes it easier for, for folks to get vaccinated. Um, you know, in talking with Lisa about it, there was one at Hanover High School a few weeks ago that we pushed out for folks. Um, you know, for students in the 16 to 19 population, they've been able to get vaccinated for a period of time now. That needle isn't moving that much, right? So it's our 12 to 15 that, um, you know, would be what people would be hoping to um, come into a vaccine clinic, but there are ample opportunities at all of the CVSs around us. There's walk-in appointments. So I, I don't think um, access to the vaccine is, is what is keeping folks from being vaccinated. So. And I know we talked about spacing, mm -hmm. but Lisa is continuing to still come into our building, so if there had been an issue, she would still point yeah, that so out to us Yeah, so when Lisa too, comes right? to our buildings, Lisa walks around in the hallway, um, she'll walk with me if she's here at North or happens to be at the building I'm in. She, she isn't meant to be um, a disruption to the learning environment, so she doesn't necessarily pop into every class and say, wait, this looks like 32 inches, this is 36, but if there's something that looks um, you know, like it isn't in line with the protocol, she'll mention it to me. Um, we had a conversation just today about mask breaks because she was um, walking through one of our elementary schools where folks were having a ma mask break indoors. Um, and though they were adequately spaced at three feet apart, there was potential to space them at six feet. And her you know, request was in those instances and in those spaces, can we place the students at six feet so then we're eliminating close contact. So um, same with some of our cafeterias. She was here at North yesterday. Um, and happen to be fourth grade lunch, and the number of students in fourth grade um, leave some available desks in the cafeteria so we could spread students out a little bit more um, and, and lessen some of the contacts when we're talking about the three feet versus the six feet of space when unmasked and eating. So. Thank you. I think that's everything I had. So um, my question is, um, I just want to make sure I understand this correctly. Um, so if theoretically there was one student in a classroom you know, an elementary classroom, for example, that tests positive. The reason why you can't um, tell the whole class just as informational purposes is because of it would be a typical violation. Right. So that's identifiable information. So if there were just to be one student absent in a grade level and we were to send out a note that says somebody in grade two has COVID, we have then by default told you who the person is that has COVID. Um, so it, it isn't, uh, it's, you know, the, the first piece of HIPAA is the privacy law. Um, I think there's some varying opinions on whether or not it's HIPAA or FERPA or, or any of those things. Um, but, you know, we are bound by confidentiality for students and staff. So anytime information is identifiable, not just unique to COVID, we don't, we don't push out information that is identifiable to a singular student or staff member. Which makes sense. So now the reason why uh, I've heard it said that HIPAA is sort of a medical thing and then why the school's involved in HIPAA if it's a medical issue. Sure. So that would be because it's a school nurse? Right, so our nurses are medical professionals. They are uh, registered nurses in all five buildings. Um, in addition, there is plenty of case law out there relative to HIPAA violations and what that means not only in the private sector but the public sector. Um, you know, I'm happy if you all are inclined to get you some additional legal resources on what a HIPAA violation looks like. Um, you know, I'm by no way, shape, or form a HIPAA expert. Um, nor an attorney, but if that's something that the committee is interested, I know that when you get questions from folks, HIPAA comes at you a lot, mm -hmm. um, and so I'm happy to get you more information if you'd like. Sure. Is that what we want? Thank you. That's all. Good. Yeah. Well, I'll go to you. I'll
snoop around and get you at the end. If you have anything. <laughs> Stacy Tiro. We were waiting for your husband. Did you ban him? What happened to Adam? <laughs> <laughs> I kept him home today. Just one quick question. Um, so with the waiver, there is zero chance at this point elementary kids are going to be unmasked. Right. So the waiver October talks 1st. about vaccination rates at 80%, which obviously our elementary students, for the most part, we do have some 12-year-old sixth graders, um, are unable to get vaccinated. But the in, in, intent, and in, I think the way we're interpreting it, is that at that October 1st time point that the, the decision be given back to local authority okay. because you know as we spoke about last time what's happening here in Pembroke is entirely different than what's happening in Lawrence or Chelsea or even Randolph and so our cases our case rates our hospitalizations even deaths are, are nowhere near what they are in other communities so a blanket mask requirement K through 12 does a disservice to communities like our own where our health data supports something different and Absolutely. you know I think that's the conversation that we had on August 17th for it to be undone um, a week later but the intent I think in our mind and, and the real desire is for the, the return of control to be given to this board. Just so you know, if they said tomorrow that no mask expected the next day, which is what happened to us back in May or June, whenever it was, we immediately followed that. The way we took the vote last, right, so the last right. meeting was to follow their guidelines. Oh, so we're, at a, we're never going to be beyond their guidelines unless we take another action. Yep. So. Yep, got it. And then the other question with the um, test and stay, is that a PCR or is that a rapid? So it's a Binex now rapid antigen test. Okay. Um, that's what the state um, is using for test and stay. And I think I said this last time and I'll reiterate it again. Um, it would always be my recommendation, Lisa has said it and our school nurses will tell you, if you receive a positive test result on any type of test, you should always follow up with your pediatrician or your primary care physician, right? So there has been so much testing abnormality, whether it's an rapid antigen, symptomatic, asymptomatic, or PCR. If my student were, to, I live in Hanover and we have tests and say, if they were to get a positive Binex now rapid test, I would immediately take them for a PCR <coughs> test with their pediatrician. Okay. So, it, you know, obviously we, we don't want to have false positives or false negatives, but it, I mean, obviously we've seen in the past 19 months that that is, exactly what's happening in a lot of instances. So we haven't had any um, positives here on our test since days. Um, again, Monday was the first day, so we have two days of testing under our belt in four of the buildings, and we haven't had any positives. All right, that's all I got. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Don, did you want to go? You're up. <laughs> Very well, thank you. Everybody knows me by now, actually. <laughs> Welcome back. God bless you. I love you all. <laughs> Listen, uh, I really gotta uh, caution you guys, and I'm not, I'm doing this out of the kindness of my heart. Mm -hmm. um, my child's good to go. My child's not wearing a mask at school. Okay? Period. He's in school, he's not wearing a mask. I'm here today for their kids to not wear a mask. Because the psychological damage, I don't think you guys realize what's gonna happen. And I have a little life experience. Okay, 20 years in the Army, around the world, Afghanistan, dealing with people who deal with uh, abused children. So my point of reference is coming from seeing child abuse, okay? So when I get passionate, that's where my head goes, okay? So just please understand, when it comes to the case, it's, it's right here. I would say that we should be prepared to go without state assistance. And you guys, we should be looking for that because any type of medical tyranny of any sort should not be complied with or tolerated. We don't have to do it. Okay? Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, at this point, you just want to go up to the mic because you would be next and we'll go to more. You can just state your name so, so it ends up in the record. Uh, my name's Jonathan Mueller, and I just want to thank the committee for following the, the medical science and following the guidance. And uh, 
you know, I, you know, I don't want my, uh, my ch I have two children going to the public schools here. Uh, they wear masks. I hope everybody, you know, there is uh, following the rules and protecting each other, and keeping each other safe. Uh, and I just want to thank you for following the guidance, getting good legal opinions, and uh, doing your dil diligence on these, uh, on this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We do have one question that came in. Sure. We're going to check. Are you good? Are you good or do you want to speak? Sure. Why don't you speak and then we'll go yep. to the email. There's just one. I'm always going to say yes. Um, following up on John's in, in, in superintendent, you gave the, the legalese. The title that you referenced, I, I think it's Title Four. I, I'm, I'm not familiar with them, honestly. But I believe they are federally mandated. Like, you have to offer those. Am I right? So Title One and Title Four. So Title Four is teacher quality. Um, they're federal grants that are entitlement grants, but the, the DESE, the Board of Education, has the ability to withhold those funds from us if we are not complying with their um, requirements to operate a school system. In the ramifications, so I'm title, thinking of the child that you have to offer these services to. Yeah, so Title One in particular, you heard Donna talk about, um, is a service that's offered at the middle school and at Bryanville. IDEA, which is our special education grant, funds some of our programming here um, in the district for our special ed students. Title Four. Um, the name of the grant is Teacher Quality. That funds a lot of the professional development for teachers and our ability to send them to workshops and to get um, um, professional training in their craft. So um, they are able to withhold federal funds from us in addition to the state um, Chapter 70 money. Thank you. Sure. Um, so the question in the mailbox is from Tracy Graham, and she just wanted to know how do the school nurses know if a child has been vaccinated? Um, so if you are... Um, contacted by the school nurse as a close contact and your student is vaccinated, um, she does need you to give a copy of the vaccination record. There is a state database um, that they're able to access and obviously she does check that first, um, but a lot of pediatricians and, and other healthcare providers um, have a backlog of uploading the test. So if your student doesn't show up in the database but you're telling us that they're vaccinated, um, a copy of the card is, is sufficient to prove vaccination. So. No other questions, we can even wait one second. Um, we held off on authorizing the superintendent for the waiver until we met because we thought in two weeks we would have said waiver. We still don't. Um, October 1st, we, this will look like we'll meet before then. Okay, yeah, I only went off of the sheet. Come on up. Sure, go ahead. Just go to the yeah, microphone absolutely. so yep. the people at home can hear you. So um, social justice is a working group that we formed here in October of 2020, October 2020. Um, so we did elicit parent volunteers, administrators, teachers um, to look at our, um, uh, you know, there's a couple of, we identified our work into buckets. So the first bucket was um, hiring practices, um, procedures and protocols that we could look at and um, improve so that we were more of a, an inclusive employer. Um, we looked at curricular resources to make sure that our resources that we have for teachers have um, diverse authors and diverse perspectives. Um, I'm trying to think what the other bucket is. Is it critical race no. It is no. not. No. 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 So critical race theory is not something that is taught in K through 12 education. It is something that is um, taught at the college and university level. It is not part of the Massachusetts state frameworks. It is not something we teach. Um, a lot of our work at, um, in Pembroke has been around inclusivity, whether it's about um, gender, sexual orientation, um, I think. It's not, it's not CRT at any, any stretch. That would, first of all, that would violate the state framework because it's not part of the frameworks, the curriculum frameworks. So the state mandates what, we, what can be taught and how it can be taught, what it has to cover and CRT is not part of it, thankfully. Um, so it's not part of what... Right, and so the, the catalyst for the formation of the group and the work was around wanting to support our teachers, right? So the, obviously the, the role of a teacher is to have a factual-based conversation with students when it comes to any topic. And what we heard from our teachers is that they needed more resources. And so identifying what areas they needed additional resources in 
um, and, and being able to you know, do some curricular planning so that, that we have the ability to fund those resources over time, make sure that they have access to professional development because we want teachers to be comfortable in their classroom answering questions of students. Uh, you know, as I said earlier, I have a seventh grader and a fourth grader and you all know kids ask the darndest things. And we want teachers to feel supported in that conversation but have made it very clear that those conversations need to be factual in nature and not opinion. Um, so I think you know the main goal of the group is to put resources and training in place so our teachers feel supported in those conversations, um, but again, not anything to do with critical race theory. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Dan Hamilton, uh, father of two kids in Bryantville Elementary. Uh, I just advocate for parents' choice. Um, I think it's a very important thing, and I, I don't hear a lot of talk about it, but for medical procedures or medical devices, it really should fall upon the parents, not others, you know, and, and, and that's very important. It seems like everybody's on board and stuff like that, and thank you. Um, I just had a question about enforcement. Um, obviously, the policy is that children wear masks, but who's enforcing it? Is it up to the educator or? Sure, um, so it is uh, our administrators that were here earlier are the ones that are really responsible for that. Obviously, teachers give verbal reminders of students around, I mean, you know, again, I have kids, we all have kids. Sometimes the mask is down here, sometimes, you know, so just verbal reminders of, of proper mask wearing. Um, but anything that is really a, a true compliance issue, which we haven't had, um, mm -hmm. really would be the building administrator. We don't want to put the teacher in a place where they're the mask police in the classroom. Just. It, it, just kind of like in, in my own little family, I'm hearing like just the lesson stops, you know, the lectures stop and the teacher's dealing with, you know, if a child has a mask, not too, you know, it's, there's a lot of discretion there depending on the educator, whether how often they're able to get a mask break and then where the mask needs to be. And it even sounds like what mask is even worn. And like, there's a lot of discretion. So each educator might have a, a different opinion. Um, so again, the verbal reminder is that the, that the mask needs to cover your nose and your mouth. Um, Are children being disciplined if their mask is not? Just a verbal, at this point all we've had, I mean we're seven days into school, is a verbal reminder. Yeah. Uh, but uh, can kids be suspended or removed from um, school? So or? we treat mask wearing as a school readiness issue. Um, so school readiness, according to our student handbooks, is handled as a, in a progressive discipline pattern, obviously a verbal warning first. Um, there is, you know, a, a progressive pattern that a progressive discipline path that could be up to and including suspension. We have not had any. We didn't have any issues last year. We didn't have any issues last, last year, year with students. Yeah. We haven't had any issues at this point this year with students. Again, there's just verbal reminders is all that's been needed. Um, kids have been amazing, and, and we said this last year. I think we, we worried about some of our students' ability to adhere to to what our expectations were, and we've had no problems. And no one's looking to catch kids doing something wrong, right? I don't think you guys are, no. but it sounds, you know, in different classrooms it might be a Right, and, and so I think it's yeah. important also to, to understand that um, our teachers and our educators are people too. We all have an opinion about COVID-19. We all have some concerns, whether they're for our own medical safety, maybe we're caring for uh, a, a sick relative or, or whatnot. So I, I do think there um, are probably teachers that are reminding students more frequently to make sure the mask is up over their nose, but there has been no, um, no discipline really that I've seen at all um, in any of the five buildings. I think the place if you have that concern, definitely bring it up in your case uh, to Jen Simmons who was here, right? Yep. Go to the principal, principal if, you, if you have a concern over it, yes. which it sounds like you have, you definitely have a conversation with her and ex express where it is and then you should look into it. I think that's what we're trying to now, as far as the, the different masks, like the type of mask that a student can wear. Right, so. Right, they can't wear the gaiters. So they can wear a gaiter so as long as it's multiply. So, so when we first um, had masking last year, there was no such thing as a multiply gaiter. There was just single ply gaiters, and now there's a market for multiply gaiters. So as long as the um, mask is multiply, so more than one ply, um, it, it they can't have the valves on them, um, and it needs to be, you know, close fitting to the, the sides of the, the cheeks and whatnot, all of that is acceptable. And you know, there's many vi different variations of masks out there. I've, I've seen um, some really creative ones and you know, I have two born kids that like to wear the blue surgical mask. So um, there's, you know, we have kids wearing gaiters, we have all types of masks. Okay, um, can an 18 year old student decide if he needs a mask break or not? Um, so at this point at the high school, the mask breaks are built into the schedule, but if you have a student that, you know, 
field could really use some additional mass breaks, or if they want to self-advocate and talk to it, talk to um, the principal or assistant principal, that we do have some students that have more frequent mass breaks. Um, you know, I, I think that's definitely a conversation that the administration, both at the middle school and high school, are um, happy to have with folks. But just, it's important, because kind of, it's a good question, I didn't thought of, but uh, kind of on that same question. We've gotten more consistent with mass breaks across, across the district, or Correct. we've been, can you talk a little bit about that? Because that happened, I don't know if it happened after the last meeting or not. I, mm -hmm. Sure, I so Mark talked a lot at the last meeting about um, mass breaks in B block and A block um, within a rotating schedule so that you weren't always missing uh, 10 minutes of science for a mass break. Um, so that is pretty consistent at the secondary level. Um, so students are get two mass breaks in addition to lunch at the secondary, le secondary level. At the elementary level, it's two mass breaks in addition to um, snack and lunch. So recess is obviously a break too. So they do get more frequent breaks at the elementary level just based off of the schedule. Um, but our um, administrators as well as our guidance counselors are happy to have conversations with families if they feel as though their student could really benefit from some additional mass breaks and have that in place. We want to make sure we identify a space for them because outside isn't always an option. Um, and we want to make sure that, you know, we're all clear on what the expectations are. You know, we're not talking about 45 minute mass breaks and whatnot. So that's an individual conversation that your student or yourself would want to have with a building principal or the guidance counselor. Thank you. I just had one other question. Um, I noticed like coming up is the, used to be the parent guardian conferences, teacher conferences. Now it's called the caregiver comp teacher conferences. The change of terminology, yeah. like was that you guys or? or? Sure, no. so um, our policies, so there's, um, there's a policy subcommittee to the school committee, which is two members. I forget who they are. If anybody wants to tell me who they are right now, I forget who you all are. Okay. I think it's, I, so we've been working through our policies um, and having them switch to, or, or to make sure there's consistency, and we consistently use caregiver in our policies as opposed to parent or guardian. Can you explain why? Because not yeah, all students just, have a parent or guardian. Right, so we've, some we've seen yeah, it. What's it, it, the ratio? Like, we've seen know, an increase just, in of, of families where a grandparent or an aunt is taking care of a student um, that isn't necessarily their parent or their legal guardian at the time. Um, they're their caregivers. And it's, sometimes it's temporary, sometimes it's more permanent. Um, but there's definitely instances where um, somebody isn't a parent or the guardian. So caregivers seem to be more in Are teachers office. considered caregivers? I'm sorry? Are teachers considered care caregivers? Um, not, not in our policy. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, thank you very much for you guys' time. Thank, thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Okay. So. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Regarding masks and breaks. I know that if it rains out, temperature's not good, teachers might decide to not take the kids out for recess or something. That becomes a little bit more significant in my mind with mass breaks correlating with that time. Um, if it's raining out, the teacher might say, we're not going to go out today, we're going to stay in, and then you lose the opportunity to take the mask off is my concern. Yes, yeah, so we've, in, we've identified indoor spaces in all of the buildings where um, students can take mask breaks at six feet apart so that they're not creating close contacts. Um, there are <clears throat> some teachers that have mask breaks in their classroom on rainy days. Again, that does create a little bit of close contact when we're talking about desks that are three feet apart, but there are spaces in each of our buildings where um, staff can take students for an indoor mask break if there's inclement weather. Can you make them do it? Because it, I don't think it's being done consistently. Can I make them do it? So I, I can if my have the building principals remind them that students are entitled to two Thank mask you. breaks in addition to snack and lunch absolutely even when it rains and snows yes okay so um, going back to the waiver we don't have the waiver we wait, wanted to wait two weeks we can take two options three options actually we can either wait till first October meeting we can uh, vote on it now or we can decide that if we get it by the 28th two weeks from tonight have a meeting on the 28th any thoughts um, open to all three do we want to wait till potentially put it I, in? I think respectively might we have to wait to see what it says I, I wouldn't be comfortable yeah. voting on something without which is fair having any idea I, I don't know what anybody changes else that have happened. yeah no that was my rationale for before and yeah. it remains in place yeah and considering that they haven't they haven't been clear up until now right. I don't think it's a reasonable assumption to think yeah. we're going to get clear guidance again. Yeah, and if, and if we need to have a meeting, I'm not on the 28th. So let's see what happens over the next week and then potentially schedule the 28th. And maybe that turns into the first October meeting. We'll have to figure it out between now and the 28th. Okay, so 
as of right now, will either be the 28th or the, is it the 5th? Yes, 10-5. Ten five. Mm -hmm. That's what we'll try and work towards. We'll make sure we can give as much notice as well. Clearly, we have to give at least 48 hours of notice. We'll try and give even more, depending upon what we hear from the, from the Commonwealth. Okay? Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, anything else on the return to school? And we did future meeting topics. So, that gives us one last thing to do on the agenda. So, we have to ratify the contracts for uh, units A, B, C, and D. So, Andy, A, B, C, T, and E. So, we, it needs four motions, four separate contracts. So, what I will do is entertain a motion to approve the memorandum of agreement and actually an authorize, is it just me or you? Okay, authorize me to sign a memorandum of agreement between the Pembroke Teachers Association, units A and B, and the Pembroke School Committee for a one-year contract followed by a three-year contract um, as presented with raises of 2% in year one of the, of the one-year contract, year one, 2% of the three-year contract, year one of the three-year contract, 2%, year two, two and a half, in year three, 2%. So, so second. So motion by Susie, second by David. Any further discussion or questions? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Abstain? That is unanimous. Okay. So is there a motion to authorize me to sign a memorandum of agreement between Pembroke Teacher Association Unit C and the Pembroke School Committee, a three-year contract, year one at two and a half percent, year two at two and a half percent, and year three at two and a half percent? So moved. Seconded. Motion by Sue, second by Susie. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? It's unanimous. And is there a motion to authorize me to sign a memorandum of agreement between the Pembroke Teachers Association Unit D and the Pembroke School Committee? It's a three-year contract as presented with a year one raise of 55 cents, year two raise of 60 cents, year three raise of 65 cents, and a 0.5% increase for the top two steps on day 91 of year three. So moved. Second. Motion by Lance, second by David. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? It's unanimous. And last, uh, authorize me to sign a memorandum of agreement between the Pembroke Teachers Association Unit E and the Pembroke School Committee for a three-year contract as presented with increases of 60 cents in year one, 60 cents in year two, and 65 cents in year three. So moved. Motion by Susie, second, second by David. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? That is also unanimous. So we covered the, no further questions came in, right? No. Okay, we covered future meeting dates. It's right now, it's pending, it'll either be the 28th if we have a, um, a waiver or it'll be the 4th if we don't have a waiver and by the 20, in ample time for the 28th for us to react. Um, so with that, I'll take a motion to go into executive session pursuant to Chapter 38, Section 21AC, discuss a personal services contract as an open meeting may have a detrimental on the legal detrimental effect on the legal position of the school committee as declared by the chair. So moved. Seconded. Motion by David, second by Susie. After with no further business will be conducted. Lance. Yes. David. Yes. Susie. Yes. Sue and yes. I'm yes. Thanks everyone. Have a good night. Thank, Thank you for you very coming. Much. Thanks everybody Thank for you. watching. Thank you. Thanks, folks.